Hey, good morning guys. Welcome back to Realty Rides and today we are going to be reviewing airplanes. Not this one of course. This is a, uh, an old Lear 24 that was developed back in the early 60s. One of the first Lear jets ever developed. And it's right outside of here a Payne Field here in Everett, Washington where I'm going to be going embarking on an orientation today with an instructor to get back into flying after over 20, 20 years of not being in a small plane. I have all my ratings, but I need to get, but I'm rusty, I need to get back into VFR flying, RFR flying, get my twin engine uh, rating back up to certification, and we'll see where we go from there. Hopefully we'll be, be able to sit in the right seat or left seat in one of these airplanes at some point. So welcome aboard. Well you guys, uh, at 65 years old, I went from these airplanes at the Boeing Company, these are 777Xs are waiting for their engines and to be delivered and certified and after 20 years I'm gonna get my currency back here with a small Cessna 172 so to kind of give you a little perspective of what 40 years of flying is all about I started flying in the uh, Tomahawk Piper Tomahawk then eventually I went to the Cessna 172, then I went to the Turbo Arrow, then I went to the 1982 Turbo Skyline Cutlass RG, which is retractable landing gear. Got my twin engine rating in a Seminole, and then these are all the private pilot study guides, instrument rating study guides, commercial pilot study guides, flight instructor study guides. And then here is the airplane the cockpit of the Merlin that I used to fly here in San Francisco. And here is my 2002 ATP uh, study guide for my written exam, which I passed. But I never took the uh, actual check ride because September 11th happened. And I work for a company called Sky Taxi. And that is me right there in the cockpit of a... 414 uh, twin Cessna. Here's my Turbine Pilots flight manual. I learned to get, I learned to fly, got my seaplane rating, and then I did a lot of flying in San Francisco. Here's Golden Gate Bridge. There's the Bay Bridge. There's downtown San Francisco skyline, and uh, here's Alcatraz. That's coming into Indianapolis when I got my commercial license. And that's where I used to live in Marin County. Give you a little indication of what uh, 40 years of flying is all about. Not to mention my years at the uh, Boeing Company as well. Where I was a quality manager for the 747. And then I gradually went over and got checked out on the MAX, the 737 MAX, and learned how to do their systems before I left in 2020. So here we are, 65 or older, maybe a couple of years younger, but nonetheless, we're of that certain age right now where we want to get back into an airplane. Uh, I started flying, like probably like many of you that are watching this channel, a long time ago. I started actually in the late 70s, but I didn't get my private license until the mid 80s. And the reason for that is I was a young guy going to work, making a living, uh, affording rent, and I had to pay for the flight lessons all on my own. And so it took me a long time to get my first private license. Then I got my multi-engine instrument rating commercial license uh, over the next two years after that, and I got all my ratings by 1989. And then in 1990, I started flying charter for a small company in San Francisco, flying turboprops and twin Cessna airplanes. But as life would have it, you know, you move on, and next thing you know, life goes by, 20 years goes by, and you haven't flown. And um, even though I have probably about 1,800 flight hours, about 600 hours of that is turbine time, I'm not, I'm not, you know, ashamed to say that I'm, I'm rusty. I need to get back into a plane. I need to learn the basics again. Uh, not that I know, don't know how to taxi. Not that I don't know how to fly a small plane. But I need to get current again. And that's what this video is all about. Because there's a lot of videos on YouTube and Instagram about young kids getting their first 1,500 hours, getting their ratings from private all the way to ATP and such. But this is for us folks that already have possibly have the ratings. You might have a private license or a commercial license or you may even have an ATP and you haven't flown in a while. So, but how do you get current again at this point? I'm 65. Am I ever going to work for the airlines? No, I will never work for the airlines again. And guess what? 
I found out I won't even be able to get my first class medical back either because that expires after 65. So what I'm trying to get now is my second class medical. So in this video, I'm going to go through all the steps, and there are so many of them that have happened over the last 20 or so odd years that were affected by events in this world that change aviation probably forever. So, um, so hang in there with me. I'm going to kind of give you guys all the guidelines of what you need to do to get back into an airplane. And there's like four or five steps that you have to do before you actually get into the airplane. These are the five main items that I think you need to get started on in order to uh, get back into a small airplane and start flying. And again, this is assuming that most of you that are willing to do this already have flight experience in the past. But if you're not, if you're a student pilot, by all means, go ahead right to the orientation flight and definitely look up uh, this flight service that I'm using here. This is called Rainier Flight Service. They are not sponsoring this video under any circumstances. This is just the company that I decided to choose at Payne Field because it's close to home and uh, they have a really good uh, you know, flight training program. So you see here, Flight Training Academy of Resources, Aviators Club, Aircraft Instructors, all sorts of stuff. This is, uh, this is just one of many, many flight uh, schools available. And um, again, so I get a lot of foreign views also. A lot of you guys are you know, in Europe or in the Middle East or maybe in Asia. So in different countries, the rules for getting your, your licenses or getting currency again may differ than what is available here in the United States with the FAA. So in any event, this is a, a discovery flight. So if you're new to flying, this is something that you should do right off the bat to see if, if, if it's something that you really want to do and, and invest your money in because it's going to be very expensive. But if you're just trying to get back into uh, flying, uh, these are some of the changes that have happened over the last... 20 years and the reason why we had a lot of incidents around the world September 11th was you know, a pivotal moment in aviation history and then uh, so it requires a lot of different changes uh, one of which has to be proof of citizenship so one of the first things they asked me when I joined Rainier Flight Service and I got an account with them which by the way you should get an account right off the bat with a flying service so that way you can get the process started because there's a lot of paperwork involved and a lot of studying as well. So you need proof of citizenship. So if you have a, an American passport or a, uh, a, what do you call it, a certificate of naturalization that shows that you're an American citizen, uh, then great. If not, then you can look up here, yes, I am a citizen, or no, I'm not a citizen, and then you'll need to go through a, a TSA um, background check with the, the National Transportation Security Administration before you can continue on. And that costs $130 and the process can take about you know a little over a month. So in any event, that's if you're not an American citizen or if you're doing this overseas. But if you're an American citizen, basically all you need is government issued ID, a birth certificate, or an, unex or an ex unexpired or expired passport. I had my passport uh, was expired and they took it and everything was fine. The other thing you're gonna need is a medical. So that's what I was talking about earlier. Uh, you're gonna need to get a medical uh, before you can start flying. Back when I started flying, uh, I didn't really didn't they, they asked for a student um, a student medical or a student certificate and that, that took the place of a third class medical, but that was years ago. Nowadays they want you to have a first class medical certificate, a second class or a third class right off the bat. So the first class again is only available for those who are going to be flying air transport pilot privileges. So if you're with the airlines, it's ATP privileges. Commuter airlines, the same thing. But uh, yeah, so if you're and you're over 65, apparently you can't have a first class medical certificate. If I'm wrong, by the way, let me know in the comments down below if I'm mistaken on this, but that's what I've been told by two or three people already. So the second class medical is what I'm going to be pursuing. It's a second class medical certificate is necessary for all commercial privileges other than ATP, air transport pilot. For those looking to fly cargo or work as a corporate pilot, which I'm hoping to do, I'm hoping at some point if the situation arises to get back into a right seat of a, a single turbine or twin turbine or even maybe a small light jet, but you know, get a type rating uh, at that point. But that's down the road. A second class medical certificate is perfect for these types of aviation jobs. And then of course, if you're new, if you're, if you're a student, um, a third class medical certificate would suffice as well. And then you also need to get, and I'm gonna, I was gonna mention this later, but I might as well do it now, you need to get need flight gear. 
And one of the things that uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, for flight later, this is an, a, uh, an app that's incredibly uh, powerful and really, you know, it's a wonderful product. But you really need to get a new headset. If you, had, if you don't already have a headset, I had one, but it's old. Um, the new headsets are actually, they're very expensive. The Bose headsets on average, brand new, are between $1,000 and $1,400. Then they have, of course, the David Clark headsets, the Telex headsets, and they have the, um, I can't think of the name of hand, um, but there's other ones as well that are available for a lot less money. You just have to find one with noise canceling capability, and that, uh, that you, oh, light speed is the one I'm thinking about, the, the light speed Zulu is also a really good headset. So I don't want to buy a brand new one. I'm not, I'm doing everything on a kind of a shoestring budget right now. So I'm looking for a used one and I found one on Craigslist for $90, a relatively, you know, barely used Telex headset with noise cancellation. And for me, 90 bucks, that's fine. And, you know, that's all I really need for now. I can always upgrade to a Bose or a nicer one a little bit later on. And then uh, let's see what else you need. You definitely need, you don't need a flight bag. A lot of stuff now, it's just a sturdy backpack and aircraft checklist. You don't really need that stuff. But you definitely need to get to a good ground school. So the ground school here at flight at Rainier Flight Service, they offer the ground school course. And you definitely need to do that because you're going to need to get handbooks and manuals, like the manuals I showed you earlier in the video. Um, it's a lot of paperwork and you're going to need to know, get updated again on charts, sectional charts and um, Victor Airway charts, high altitude charts if you're going to be flying high altitude again. There's a lot of different things that you need to you know, brush up on and I will go over that just in a few minutes. Another thing that you need is supplemental aircraft insurance. Now when I started flying years ago, there was no supplemental aircraft insurance. You just paid your hourly rate, your wet rate for the plane and the instructor and off you went. Now they require you to have supplemental aircraft insurance uh, which is about $20 per flight or $100 per month. Um, it's not a lot but you definitely have to negotiate that with the insurance company and with the flight school that you're working with. So here's a really an important page that's on the FAA uh, administration's website. Um, the guide for aviation medical examiners. First of all, you know, none of this is going to happen if we don't get a medical back. Um, again, I'm trying to get a second class medical. And um, everyone's health is different. Everyone is in different shapes and different sizes, different eyesights, different hearing uh, weights. Um, I've been trying to exercise myself. I'm, uh, I weigh 180 pounds. I'm 5 foot 10. And you can, t you if you're following my channel, you know I'm a pretty active guy. I ride motorcycles, I drive sports cars, I do a lot of filming for this channel, and um, so I keep myself in relatively good shape. I run on the treadmill every day, and um, you know I try to stay in shape. But there's no nothing's guaranteed, and my eyesight over the years used to be 20/20, and uncorrected, and it's gotten a little, you know, it's gotten worse. I'm 65 now, so I need to have reading glasses in order to read this computer screen that I'm showing you guys. But this is what the requirements are for the medical certificate for a first class for the transport pilot, second class for the regular pilot, and the third class for the private pilot. So uh, there's a lot to read here. Basically, it's 2040 or better in each eye separately with or without correction for the third class pilot. And for the first class and second class, it's 2020 or better in each eye separately with or without correction. So in any event, um, that's for the examiner is going to check check for you uh, in terms of your eyesight and of course color vision the ability to perceive those colors necessary for a safe performance of airman duties uh, your hearing the audiology the audiometric speech discrimination score um, got a test at least 70 percent perception in one ear an intensity of no greater than 65 decibels and then you have the ear conditioning ear condition um, and then you have the pulse, blood pressure, electric car cardiogram, EKG, I'm sorry, EC ECG at age 35 and annually after age 40. That's for the first class medical only. I used to have those every six months. But it's not, requi not required for the second and third class. And then, of course, no diagnosis of psychosis or bi bipolar disorder or severe personality disorder. And that was probably due to a fact that over the last few years there have been pilot 
um, incidents where the pilots cause the airplanes to you know develop into a, a critical situation. And then substance dependence and substance abuse, they're going to check on that. And the disqualifying conditions, unless otherwise directed by the FAA, the examiner must deny or defer if the applicant has a history of diabetes, angina, coronary heart disease, cardiac valve replacement, peripheral cardiac. Okay, basically, if you have already heart issues, you're bipolar, psychosis, personality disorder that is severe enough to have repeatedly manifested itself by over overt acts. Anyways, a lot to read here, so you know definitely check this page out for the summary of medical standards when you get your medical. Again, if you don't get a medical, a second class or even a third class medical, then all this is for nothing and you're not going to be able to fly an airplane again. But if you get a second class, you know, second class medical um, after you pass, then you know, you're in great shape and but you have to go through the medical examiner, make sure that um, you get, uh, that you pass all the medical requirements to fly an airplane again. Very important, that's the first thing you should do after you get hooked up with the flight school is to get yourself a medical examiner and get your test and get your either your second class or your uh, third class. So after you get hooked up with a flight school of your choosing and you've got yourself pretty much set up with a, an instructor that you know that you like uh, that you're compatible with because that's also very important to get someone that you that you click with. You don't want someone that's going to be giving you a hard time and you're going to feel like you're going to be intimidated by that person. So you need to get someone that you're compatible with and that you can le learn from and have a good relationship with in the cockpit when you're flying. So the first thing you need, at least this flight school here, is going to wants, wants me to conduct uh, conduct an effective flight review, which of course to show that I am, you know, capable of, you know, knowing how to fly a plane. So it here, step one is preparation, uh, managing expectation assignments, ground review, regulatory, cross-country flight plan review, weather decision making, risk management, and personal minimums, general aviation safety issues. Know the basic skills of the physical airplane, the mental airplane systems knowledge, aeronautical decision making, post-flight debriefing, aeronautical health maintenance. Know my personal proficiency practice plan. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on here, right? And uh, so, pilot's aeronautical history, regulatory review check, pilot's cross-country checklist, three Ps, security checklist, personal minimums, a lot of stuff. It's 23 pages, and uh, you have to kind of go through all of this before, and then they're going to give you a little quiz afterwards to see how much knowledge you actually have before you're ready to start your actual review and get yourself back into VFR flying. And we're not even talking IFR, we're talking VFR at this point. And uh, so, you know, again, I'm just wanting to do this and uh, getting back to a point where I'm going to be able to fly a plane again alone and carry passengers in and feel safe and competent and because uh, everything has changed in this uh, environment um, a lot. So there's a lot to read here and this is something that, I, look, physical airplane skills, does the pilot maintain control of the aircraft when faced with a major distraction? For satisfactory flight review, the pilot should be able to perform all maneuvers in accordance with the practical test standards. So, again, after 20 years, um, this is stuff that we're going to have to sit there and really study and and uh, definitely practice uh, on a home simulator, which by the way, I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes. highly recommend that you get a little home flight simulator. Use Microsoft Flight Simulator get a little yoke and practice some of these maneuvers at home before you actually go into the real plane because that will be helpful and will save you lots of money in the long run. And another item that you might want to use in to add to your tools to get back into flying uh, is a product called ForeFlight. It is an app that was based um, built by the Boeing company that allows pilots to give you enormous amount of capability and uh, options when flying a plane. Everything from flight planning, weather data, airports around the country, actually all around the world, gives you the runway depictions and taxiways, advanced flight planning, just enormous amount of support and it's really easy to use. It comes in three different plans. Highly recommend you look, look up forflight.com. I will put the, the, the link in the description down below. It's an incredible product. Um, it's highly recommended that you use it now. Back in the day when we were flying professionally, we had what's called Jeppesen Airway Charts. Well, you don't have to use those anymore because the Jeppesen Airway Charts are now embedded in ForeFlight for your capability and for your use. 
highly recommend you look for a flight. Add that to your list of things that you need when you get back into flying. All right, you guys. So this is a Cessna 172 with the Garmin displays in the off position, but this is a relatively new 172. Way newer than the planes I used to fly back in the 80s. But I just had a nice orientation with my future orientation flight instructor. And I'll be flying, hopefully this up in a couple of weeks, but right now I'm gonna be doing a little ground school. And I gotta get my class, second class medical, because at 65, you're no longer allowed to have a first class medical because you can't fly for the airlines. But this is the Cessna 172 with the Garmin 1000 navigation system that I will be flying here shortly to get my currency back up for my VFR currency and my IFR currency and then later on I'll go and get my twin engine currency so I can fly twin engine planes yet again. So now that you've got your little home flight simulator set up, and again, I highly recommend that we do this. Uh, it's not expensive. Microsoft Flight Simulator uh, software is only about $100. And you can install it into you know, your latest uh, Windows machine. Uh, but here's uh, your conventional six pack. This is what we used to fly with. Uh, commercial jets used to operate with the six pack. Um, you know, your six basic instruments. And now uh, these are now embedded and in the new electronic technology, which I will come to in a few minutes. But again, just for a fast review for all of us, on the upper left is, the, of course, the airspeed indicator that tells you how fast you are in knots. The center is the artificial horizon, of course, that gives you the, the relation in terms of your angle to the ground and to the clouds and to the sky. And on the right-hand side is your altimeter. It tells you how high you're flying. Uh, lower left hand is the turn coordinator to keep you um, nice and straight when you make a turn left or right. Keep this ball centered. In the center is, of course, the, the, the directional gyro that's electronically um, operated and it acts as a compass that gives you your heading in 24. This happens to be 270, which is straight direct west. And then finally is your vertical speed indicator that tells you how fast or how fast you're climbing or descending. From 500 to 1,000 feet or 1,500 feet per minute, whatever, or even to 2,000 feet for that matter. Uh, so it's your VSI. So again, your airspeed indicator, artificial horizon, altimeter, turn coordinator on the left hand side, DG in the middle, and then your VSI. So this is part of the new technology that you can expect to see now in um, new modern airplanes and even old airplanes that have this new technology uh, been, you know, the old six pack was, was replaced with the, the Garmin G1000. It has a bunch of different, uh, um, you know, options and a lot of different products, but the Garmin is the most popular and it's the easiest to use. So you can see the six pack now is kind of embedded in the actual, um, uh, display itself. So again, here's the airspeed indication. This is a little tape that goes up and down. Here's the artificial horizon, which of course here's the brown part here on the bottom. On the right hand side here you have your altimeter and of course here is your, your directional gyro. And um, I'm still learning this myself so you know I'm not quite sure exactly where the VSI is here. It's probably right here. I'm not sure. That's probably right, right here. Anyways, there's lots of videos on YouTube that will give you the tutorial on how to use this. And um, I'm learning how to use it myself. And uh, on Microsoft Flight Simulator that I got, the G1000 is in the system. So it has the six pack too. You can still use the six pack if you want to, to kind of practice your turns and, and your level flight and your descents and your climbs. Um, but I'm going to be doing both. I'm going to be practicing with six pack just to kind of get my bearings again. And then I'm going to start using only the new technology because that is exactly what's available now on, uh, on, on the majority of these training aircraft that uh, we'll all encounter. Okay guys, so I hope you liked this little video that I did for you to kind of show you the different steps to getting back into a small airplane. Once again, make sure that you get your flight medical as soon as possible. Make sure you get established with a flight school. 
and uh, and spend a couple dollars on buy your flight simulator. Uh, you'll be it'll be worth your while. You can be able to practice all these maneuvers at home. Practice till you get to the point where you get really really sharp at it. It'll save you money in the long run. It'll save you money for renting an airplane and practicing up there in the sky. And your instructor will be very impressed with the newfound skills you have once you get back into a plane. Okay, so thanks again for watching Realty Rides. I hope you guys like this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe. The next video, I will show you some maneuvers that I've learned on Flight Simulator myself. Thanks again for watching, and have a great trip. Nice flight, and we'll see you guys soon.